All right, guys, welcome back. Um, we are on, I think, part seven of our journey through Shaman Tiny's Beowulf. And when we last left our boy Beowulf, he had triumphed over Grendel's mother. He had brought Grendel's decapitated head back to King Hrothgar. And he had been rewarded richly by Hrothgar with gold and gems and weapons and horses and all this stuff. And he'd loaded all that stuff back on his ship, he and his men, and they were sailing for home. So what we're going to see in this section is Beowulf arriving home and presenting himself to King Higlock, his lord, back in Geatland, and basically giving him a report of what happened. So a lot of this is going to be repetition where we're hearing again Beowulf conduct or explain um, his own exploits. Okay. Now remember, in a poem long, in a long poem like this, that would have been performed out loud. Repetition is important because sometimes people didn't hear what was said earlier. We see this all the time in um, the Odyssey and the Iliad, right? Particularly in the Odyssey, where you, um, Odysseus shows up and tells his story of what happened to him. Also, the tradition of your hero going in and telling about his exploits to someone important, a king, a lord is a pretty big tradition in these epic literature okay so if you open up your text we are going to begin on page um not that one there we go page 131 with line um 1905 you ready beowulf and his men are in the boat they've just set sail Right away, the mast was rigged with its sea shawl. Isn't that great? There's a kenning for you in your notes for the Old English about kennings. A sea shawl instead of a sail, but like a shawl. Sail ropes were tightened, timbers drummed, and stiff winds kept the wave crosser skimming ahead. As she heaved forward, her foamy neck was fleet and buoyant, a lapped prow loping over currents until finally the Geats caught sight of coastland and familiar cliffs. The keel reared up, the wind lifted it home, it hit on the land. So very smooth sailing, right? The harbor guard came hurrying out to the rolling water. Now this is a different harbor guard than we saw earlier in the poem because now, this, now we're in Geatland, right? And they're welcoming Beowulf home. He had watched the offing long and hard on the outlook for those friends. With the anchor cables, he moored their craft right where it had beached, in case a backwash might catch the hull and carry it away. Then he ordered the prince's treasure trove to be carried ashore. It was a short step from there to where Hrethel's son and heir, Higlock the gold giver, makes his home on a secure cliff in the company of retainers. So he didn't have far to go to go to Higlock's home, his own mead hall. The building was magnificent, the king majestic, ensconced in his hall, and although Higod, his queen, was young, a few short years at court, her mind was thoughtful and her manners sure. So she's, he's married a very young woman for his queen. She's only been at court for a short period of time, but she's already very gracious, she's very clever, um, and she has good manners, so she's very, she knows how to respect people and treat people. Heriath's daughter behaved generously and stinted nothing when she distributed bounty to the Geats. So here she is, now she's the ring giver, right? She's giving them rewards. Great Queen Modthrith perpetrated terrible wrongs. Okay, who, why, what? All right, remember that we get lots of exposition here where they're comparing like someone good that they're speaking about here to someone bad from their history or their legend. And we often don't because we went through the Dark Ages and we don't have their legends anymore. So we don't know who this queen is. The only mention we have of her is in this poem. But our poet is comparing this good queen in the Geat Hall to this bad queen from legend, okay? And he's using it to teach us lessons. 
Great Queen Modthrith perpetrated terrible wrongs. If any retainer ever made bold to look her in the face, if even an eye not her lord's stared at her directly during daylight, the outcome was sealed. He was kept bound in hand-tightened shackles, racked, tortured until doom was pronounced, death by the sword, slash of blade, blood gush and death qualms in an evil display. Even a queen outstanding in beauty must not overstep like that. So this queen was so awful, if any guy, any guy who wasn't her husband even looked at her, she sentenced them to torture and death. Yikes. A queen should weave peace not punish the innocent with loss of life for imagined insults. But Hemming's kinsmen put a halt to her ways, and drinkers round the table had another tale. She was less of a bane to people's lives, less cruel-minded, after she was married to the brave Offa, a bride arrayed in her gold finery, given away by a caring father, ferried to her young prince over dim seas. In days to come she would grace the throne, and grow famous for her good deeds and conduct of life, her high devotion to the hero king who was the best king, it has been said, between the two seas or anywhere else on the face of the earth. Offa was honored far and wide for his generous ways. Okay, so she used to do that, this bad queen, but then her father married her off to somebody else, and she learned the error of her ways and she got better. generous ways, his fighting spirit, and his far-seeing defense of his homeland. From him there sprang Eomer, if that sounds familiar from Lord of the Rings, this is where it came from, Garamond's grandson, kinsman of Hemming, his warrior's mainstay and master of the field. Master of the field means you're very, very good at riding horses, like Eomer in Lord of the Rings. Okay, heroic Beowulf and his band of men were back in the present crossed the wide strand, striding along the sandy foreshore. The sun shone, the world's candle, there's another kenning, warmed them from the south as they hastened to where, as they had heard, the young king, Ongenthrow's killer and his people's protector, was dispensing rings inside his brawn. Beowulf's return was reported to Hicklock as soon as possible, news that the captain was now in the enclosure, his battle brother, back from the fray, alive and well, walking to the hall. Room was quickly made on the king's orders and the troops fill, filed across the cleared floor. So they hear Beowulf's coming and the king's like, all right, make room. And Beowulf comes in with his guys and there's space for them to be. After Hicklock off, had offered greetings to his loyal thane in lofty speech, he and his kinsmen, that hail survivor, sat face to face. So he's sitting down face to face with Beowulf. Harriet's daughter, this is the queen, moved about with the mead jug in her hand, taking care of the company, filling the cups that warriors held out. Remember how the queen did that in um, Denmark? And here the other queen is doing exactly the same thing. So although they're two different countries, they have a lot of the same traditions. Then Higlock began to put courteous questions to his old comrade in the high hall. He hankered to know every tale the sea geats had to tell. How did you fare on your foreign voyage, dear Beowulf, when you abruptly decided to sail across the salt water and fight at Herat? Did you help Hrothgar much in the end? Could you ease the prince of his well-known troubles? Your undertaking cast my spirits down. I dreaded the outcome of your expedition and pleaded with you long and hard to leave the killer be. Let the South Danes settle their own blood feud with Grendel. Be so God be thanked, I'm granted this sight of you safe and sound. So apparently the king told him, don't go, let them deal with their own problems. But as we now know, Beowulf, by going there and saving them, has actually created treaty between these two countries and like friendship. Beowulf, son of Ekthrow, spoke. What happened, Lord Higlock, is hardly a secret any more among men in this world. Myself and Grendel, coming to grips on the very spot where he visited destruction on the victory shieldings and violated life and limb, losses I avenged, so no earthly offspring of Grendel's need ever boast about that bout before dawn, no matter how long the last of his evil family survives. Ooh. That's a suggestion that Beowulf, that Grendel might have kids somewhere, 
or like family somewhere who might come back for revenge or might talk about that fight. Ooh, that's an interesting idea. Okay. When I first landed, I hastened to the ring hall and saluted Hrothgar. Once he discovered why I had come, the son of Healthdane sent me immediately to sit with his own sons on the bench. It was a happy gathering. In my whole life, I have never seen mead enjoyed more in any hall on earth. Sometimes the queen herself appeared, peace pledge between nations to hearten the young ones and hand out a toke to a warrior, then take her place. Sometimes Hrothgar's daughter distributed ale to older ranks in order on the benches. I heard the company call her Freya, we Freya Waru as she made her rounds, presenting men with a gem-studded bowl, young bride-to-be to the gracious Ingeld in her gold-trimmed attire. Ooh, this is the first we're hearing of her. Apparently, uh, Hrothgar has a daughter who's old enough to be pledged to be married, and she was distributing mead in the hall. The friends of the Shieldings favors her betrothal. The guardian of the kingdom sees good in it and hopes this woman will help heal old wounds and grievous feuds. Okay, so his daughter is going to be married off to the leader of a, a, another group that he's been having problems with in the hope that the two of them, that that marriage is going to form an alliance. Um, very often marriages between royals leading all the way up to fairly modern day were often more about alliances than they were about love. But generally the spear is prompt to retaliate when a prince is killed, no matter how admirable the bride might be. So he's, he's thinking maybe this alliance won't work. Think how the Heraboths are bound to feel, their lord Ingeld and his loyal thanes, when he walks in with that woman to the feast. Danes are at the table being entertained, honored guests in glittering regalia, burnished ring mail that was their host's birthright, looted when the Hithabards could no longer wield their weapons in that shield clash, when they went down with their beloved comrades and forfeited their lives. Okay, he's, th he's saying to his lord, listen... Hrothgar's got this plan about this wedding. I'm not sure it's going to work. Here's why. Imagine that you are at a wedding, okay, and you're a guest, and the, um, the groom fought your people, and he walks in wearing all this jewelry and all this armor and all this fancy stuff he actually stole from your people when they were defeated. Now, they wouldn't think of it as stealing, really, because he won it in battle, but still. Like, that's going to cause some hard feelings, right? Then an old spearman will speak while they're drinking, having glimpsed some heirloom that brings alive memories of that massacre. His mood will darken and heart-stricken. In the stress of his emotion, he will begin to test a young man's temper and stir up trouble, starting like this. Now, my friend, don't you recognize your father's sword, his favorite weapon, the one he wore when he went out in his war mask to face the Danes on that final day? All right, so he's like, and some old guy is going to get drunk and going to start causing trouble and, you know, stirring up old thoughts. After Weathergill died and his men were doomed, the Shieldings quickly claimed the field. And now here's a son of one or other of those same killers coming in through our hall, overbearing us, mouthing boasts and rigged in armor that is by right is yours. And so he keeps on, recalling and accusing and working things up in bitter words until one of the lady's retainers lies splatted in blood, split open on his father's account. The killer knows the lie of the land and escapes with his life, and then on both sides the oath-bound lords will break the peace. A passionate hate will build up in Ingeld, and love for his bride will falter in him as the feud rankles. I, therefore, suspect the good faith of the Heatherbards, the truth of their friendship, and the trustworthiness of their alliance with the Danes. Okay, so not only is he telling, like, oh, this is what happened, but he's giving his king, like, some insight into the relationships between Hrothgar's men and Hrothgar's kingdom and the other kingdoms nearby and basically the state of play. But now, my lord, it's like I, that really wasn't what you asked me about. But now, my lord, I shall carry on with my account of Grendel, the whole story of everything that happened in this hand-to-hand -hand fight. After Heaven's gem had gone mildly to earth, 
so after sunset, that maddened spirit, the terror of those twilights, came to attack us, where we stood guard and still safe inside the hall. There, deadly violence came down on Hansako. Ah, that's the name of the guy who was killed. And he fell as fate ordained, the first to perish, rigged out for the combat. A comrade from our rank had come to grief in Grendel's maw. He ate up the entire body. There was blood on his teeth. He was bloated and furious, all roused up, yet still unready to leave the hall empty-handed. Renowned for his might, he matched himself against me, wildly reaching. He had this roomy pouch, a strange accoutrement, intricately strung and hung at the ready, a rare patchwork of devilishly fitted dragon skins. Okay, this is new information that Grendel is wearing some kind of pouch, like a bag or purse made from woven together dragon skin. I had done him no wrong, and yet the raging demon wanted to cram me and many other into this bag. Oh, so that's how he carried like 30 people back. He put them in his bag. But it was not to be, once I got to my feet in a blind fury. It would take too long to tell how I repaid the terror of the land for every life he took, and so won credit for you, my king, and for all of my people. And although he got away to enjoy life's sweetness for a while longer, his right hand stayed behind him in her rot, evidence of his miserable overthrow as he dived into murk on the mere bottom. I got lavish rewards from the Lord of the Danes for my part in the battle, beaten gold and much else. Once morning came and we took our places at the banquet table. There was singing and excitement. An old reciter, a carrier of stories, recalled the old days. At times, some hero made the timbered harp tremble with sweetness, or related true and tragic happenings. At times, the king gave the proper turn to some fantastic tale, or a battle-scarred veteran, bowed with age, would begin to remember the martial deeds of his youth and prime, and be overcome as the past welled up in his wintry heart. All right. Remember in your notes, one of the qu characteristics of an epic is singing and poetry, and he's talking about some of those songs and poems that we've heard. We were happy there the whole day long and enjoyed our time until another night descended upon us. Then suddenly the vehement mother avenged her son and wreaked devastation, destruction. Death had robbed her, Geats had slain Grendel, and so his ghastly dam struck back and with bare defiance laid a man low. Thus life departed from the sage Asheri, a wise, elder wise in counsel. But afterwards, on the morning following, the Danes could not burn the dead body, nor lay the remains of the man they loved on his funeral pyre. She had fled with the corpse, and taken refuge beneath the torrents on the mountain. It was a hard blow for Hrothgar to bear, harder than any he'd undergone before, because remember it was Hrothgar's best friend. And so the heart-sore king beseeched me in your royal name to take my chances under water, to win glory and prove my worth. He promised me rewards. Hence, as is well known, I went to my encounter with the terror monger at the bottom of the tarn. For a while it was hand to hand between us. Then blood went curling along the currents and I beheaded Grendel's mother in the hall with a mighty sword. I barely managed to escape with my life, my time had not yet come. But Healthdane's heir, the shelter of those earls, again endowed me with gifts in abundance. Thus, King acted with due custom. I was paid and recompensed completely, given full measure and the freedom to choose from Hrothgar's treasures by Hrothgar himself. These, King Higlock, I am happy to present to you as gifts. These King Higlock, I am happy to present to you as gifts. It is still upon your grace that all favor depends. So, like, I'm I'm happy that Hrothgar likes me. I'm happy I could help him. But you're still my lord. I still depend on you. I have few kinsmen who are close, my king, except for your kind self. Then he ordered the boar-framed standard to be brought, the battle-topping helmet, the mail shirt gray as hoarfrost and the precious war sword, and proceeded with his speech. 
When Hrothgar presented this, this war gear to me, he instructed me, my lord, to give you some account of why it signifies his special favor. He said it had belonged to his older brother, King Herogar, who had long kept it, but that Herogar had never bequeathed it to his son, Heofward, that worthy scion, Lord, loyal as he was. Enjoy it well. So all this war gear, you're, you're noticing it all comes with stories, right? Like, hey, here's this awesome stuff. Here's where it comes from. Here's why it's important. I heard four horses were handed over next. Beowulf bestowed four bay steeds to go with the armor, swift gallopers all alike. So ought a kinsman act, instead of plotting and planning in secret to bring people to grief or conspiring to arrange the death of comrades. The warrior king was uncle to Beowulf and honored by his nephew. Each was concerned for the other's good. So by including all of this, I mean, it's kind of boring, right? Like, okay, why, are, why is he even including all of this? Well, because he's using it to show how you act with courtesy. How do you act respectfully? And sometimes he just comes and straight out tells us, and other times he's using, like, actions speak louder than words, right? He's using this as an example. I heard he presented Hig, Higd with a gorget, the pre priceless toke that the prince's daughter Wethelfau had given him, and three horses, supple creatures, brilliantly saddled. The bright necklace would be luminous on Higd's breast. Thus Beowulf bore himself with valor. He was formidable in battle, yet behaved with honor, and took no advantage. Never cut down a comrade who was drunk, kept his temper, and warrior that he was, watched and controlled his godsent strength and his outstanding natural powers. He had been poorly regarded for a long time, was taken by the Geats for less than he was worth, and their lord had never much esteemed him in the Mead Hall. They firmly believed that he lacked force, that the prince was a weakling, but presently every affront to his deserving was reversed. Okay. Remember back in the notes, uh, one of the notes was a hero with a despised past, and we were like, but everybody loves Beowulf. What's the deal? Okay, now they love Beowulf. But back in the day, back when he was first taken in, right, by his uncle, nobody liked him much and everybody underestimated him. So he is a hero with a despised past. So you could put that in your notes. All right, we're almost done with this section. The battle-famed king, bulwark of his earls, ordered a gold-chased heirloom of Hrethels to be brought in. So now the king is, is ordering, right, Beowulf gave the king a bunch of treasure. Now the king is ordering more treasure to be turned around and given to Beowulf. It was the best example of a gem-studded sword in the Geat treasury. This he lay on Beowulf's lap and then rewarded him with land as well. 7,000 hides. A hide is a measurement of land. So he's giving Beowulf a huge amount of land and a hall and a throne. Both owned land by birth in that country, ancestral grounds, but the greater right and sway were inherited by the higherborn. A lot was to happen in later days in the fury of battle. Okay, now we're jumping forward. Like, so Beowulf gets money and power and a title and land and all of this and he's going to be ruling a group of people and to a certain extent he's the king's heir and now we're going to jump forward here a lot was to happen in later days in the fury of battle Higlock fell and the shelter of Herdred's shield proved useless against the fierce aggression of the shiflings ruthless swordsmen seasoned campaigners they came against him and his conquering nation and with cruel force cut him down so that afterwards the wide kingdom reverted to beowulf so instead of just ruling his section beowulf inherits the whole kingdom he ruled it well for 50 winters grew old and wise as warden of the land okay and i know we're in the middle of a sentence but we're going to end there we're going to end at 2210. All right. So we've seen Beowulf become his own king, and it's 50 years on, and uh, something's about to happen. And we will leave it there. So next time, we are going to jump in with what happens when old king 50, you know, 
60, 65, 70, 80 year old Beowulf, how old he is now, he's been king for 50 years. What happens when he, there's a threat to his kingdom and he's an old, weak king? All right, but until then, keep working in Schoology and I'll see you next time.